Okay. That's not what I want to talk about. We're going to end the structures next week. I want to review functions. Um, I want to talk about how to write functions. are going to write are going to provide functionality via functions that exist on an object. Things like Overwatch heroes, for instance, they have functions that let you do things to those heroes. So here are the three things you need to do in order to use functions. First, you have to provide a definition. You have to tell me what does that function do? Like what is the actual lines of code that this function will execute when you call it? The second is you need to provide a prototype, which means you have to describe ahead of time what does that function look like so that people know, people meaning like people that look at your header file, people that are other programmers that are on your project that want to use something that you wrote, will see that prototype and understand via the name and the arguments that are passed in and the return type, kind of the general shape of what that function will do. For instance, if there is a function called get health and it returned an integer, what would you think that function does? Help of wherever you're calling. So if the hero in Overwatch has a get help, it has the name get help, the prototype would be like int get help because it tells you that it returns an integer for help. Or maybe you have a function called um, kill, and that's all it does. It has no, pro no, no return type with no arguments. You just call kill, the prototype would just be void kill because that's what it does. It, it kills the thing that you're calling it on. The third part is to actually call the function in the right way. So that is providing all the arguments that that function needs as well as using a return value if necessary. So let's go over. This is demonstrating those three parts, which is the simplest version of a function uh, we can do. This is all in uh, Chapter 7, by the way, in the book. Uh, you guys are going to be the homework in the lab. The lab and the homework will be from Chapter 7. So you're going to be following this. So um, there's three parts to this, which is the prototype, the definition, and the call site. So as I just mentioned, the definition, which is what that function does, is right here at the bottom, where it says void simple. And it does uh, a C out statement to tell you that it's a simple function. The prototype looks a lot like the definition, but it's at the top with a semicolon at the end of it, instead of any lines of code. That All that prototype is there for is to provide you with the return type, which is void, the name of the function, and any arguments that that function needs. Prototypes are commonly found inside header files. There's a specific reason for that. Typically, when you're compiling your code, you put your prototype inside your header file and your definition inside your CPP file, which we're going to get into more this quarter. Okay. But in this case here, my prototype is at the top. And remember, the program compiles top to bottom. So when you want to call your function here inside of main, when you call the simple function, you can see it calls simple just by putting the name of the function in instead of parentheses. The first thing it's going to do is see, hey, do I know what this function is like? Oh, I do because I saw the prototype first. Okay, That prototype is at the top of the file. As it's compiling, it sees, okay, I see simple. Then later, it doesn't actually have to have this definition right away. The only thing it needs to call a function is to see the prototype. Then later, it's like, okay, you promised me that there's a function called simple somewhere. It doesn't have to be right now. It can be way later. But somewhere, you're telling me, because I looked at the prototype, that there's a function definition for simple. It keeps compiling, gets to the end of main, realizes that, oh, here it is. This is where the definition came, right? questions on that. So those three parts are what you need for a function every time. Okay. You always need a prototype. There are some cases where you can combine the definition with the prototype. So if you just put that definition at the top, it both is a prototype and a definition. However, for the sake of what we're doing now, uh, we're just going to always declare them separately. However, you can have this definition above main and then not have the prototype, in which case that's an inline function. So basically you're defining the function like at the same time you're doing the prototype, which means you don't have to have the prototype. There are some downsides to doing it that way, 
It's specifically the downsides are for when you're dealing with header files. So when you have a header file and you have a prototype in there that is also the definition, it makes it so that sometimes you can't actually compile your project because of dependencies between what's in your function and what that function needs. So that's why like just for this class and for next class, I really want to stress on just having a prototype every time. So there's kind of two categories for functions, and I talked about this at the end of last quarter. This is kind of a refresher, but it's really important. Uh, there's two types. One kind of function is the kind that returns a value after you're calling it. So when it comes back after it's done its work, it brings with it a value, which is the return value. And then there's a type of function that doesn't have any return value. The ones that don't have any return value are termed void functions. And they look like this, where they have literally the word void where the return type would be. Look here. There's void right there. Notice that in the void function, we have your statements, your lines of code that you write. Then you have a keyword for return. That return is optional. It's optional because at the end of this function, if it hits this line of code, it's the last line of code, imagine this return wasn't there, it'll just automatically return. The parameter list here at the top indicates the type of information, the type of arguments passed to the function, as well as how many of those. For each argument you pass, they'll be separated by commas. I'll get to that more in a few slides. And return, if you have it, is where the function ends. If you don't have it, it ends where the last closing brace is. Don't worry about the part where it says pass style procedures, Fortran subroutines, modern basic. Basically, every program language, for the most part, has a variation of functions. Every, this is a very common construct, whether you're using C Sharp, or Python, or C, or basic, or whatever, there is always usually a concept of function. Even Unreal's Blueprint has the concept of a function. They all kind of follow the same pattern. You call some module of functionality, you pass it information that it would care about, and it gives you back information when it's done. Or if it doesn't give you back information like this, it's a void function, which means it just does some work and then says I'm done. Okay. So look at this function value down here. So here's a function called tiered, which all it does is just prints out the word tiers some number of times. Okay. So the name of the function is tiers. The return type is void. There's one argument in that list. That parameter list, that this right here, which I have is equal to the stuff inside the parentheses, you're basically declaring variables that are required to call that function. You are declaring a variable that's named n. What that means is whoever calls that function has to pass you a value that's going to live in that variable n when they call it. So if you call cheers, you are forced to tell this function how many, what number you want to put in that variable n. Okay, that is a requirement of this. So when you call that function, you pass with it what you want the value of n to be. And inside the function, it uses that argument right here in the loop inside that for loop. And so this for loop, the way it works is it takes that variable of n that's required for whoever's calling it and uses it inside the for loop. So this function, the way it works is it lets you type the word cheers however many times you want to whenever you call it. So this, this uh, function expects that to be passed, expects that to be passed to you. Notice there's no return statement here. So it's going to run the loop. After it's done looping over n times in the loop, so if I pass in 10 here, when I call this function, it will write that output 10 times. Questions on this? OK, this is a very common thing that you pass in arguments. Let's go over one that has a return value. So you can have a function. This is exactly the same as the last slide with two exceptions. One is it doesn't have void. It has what's called a type name. This is a variable type. This is like int. 
or bool or string or bool or double. Type name there indicates the value that will return to whoever called it. So for instance, square root, for instance, if you call square root, square root has a return value, which is a double, that returns the square root of that function. this return here is no longer optional. Okay? If you have a return value, you are required to put a return statement. And you have to tell it what to return. And that thing that you return has to match the type of that function. The type of this function, if it was an integer or double, you will have to return an integer or double. It can be anything that as long as the type matches. It can be a constant or variable or an expression. It just has to match. You can't return an array, but you can return pretty much anything else. And when you return it, it gives it back to the person that called it. So let me show you. Here's the simplest example of how to use a function that has a return type. Same thing, it has a prototype at the top, has a definition and the function call, right? So the prototype says, hey, it's a double return type, which means the type of this function is a double. The name of this function is called cubed, and it takes one argument, which is also a double, called x. So that means whoever calls this function has to pass in a double, which will then get used in the definition down here. So this function, what it actually does, it takes a number and returns you the cubed value of that number. So that multiplied by itself, three times. Let's start with the arrows here. Okay, so we have a variable called q in main. We're going to set it equal to the return value of that function. So we call this function q, which is the name of the function we declared above. We are forced to pass in a number, uh, some number. It can be a variable or it can be a, a regular number like that, but it has to be a double. It goes and calls this function. Right? So it runs this function cubed. It says, hey, return the number that you passed in, which is 1.2 here, times itself three times. It goes and takes this, shoves it back into this box, which is 1.728. When it goes back, when this thing returns, it takes with it the result of this operation and puts it back in the queue. I know this is like kind of simple stuff, but like I really want anyone to call out if they're having issues with it because this is like going to be a very common thing we're going to be doing with object-oriented programming, writing a lot of functions. I'm going to be asking you guys to write a function that has a return type of string, takes two arguments, that takes an integer and a character, or has a return type of void and takes three arguments. So you need to be comfortable with, when I say arguments, I mean this up here. That's like separated by comma. So when you have multiple arguments, you can have that. You can return more than once in a function. You can have, sorry, you can have more than one return statement in a function. For instance, if you have an if else block, you're guaranteed that in an if else block, remember, only one of those lines of code will ever be run. In that case, you actually have to specify return for each of those cases. If you leave one of these out, like if you don't do a return in here and you only put in else, the compiler will actually tell you, hey, I'm missing a potential place where you might be returning, where you might not be returning. So again, here, this function returns back the value 1.728. It's returning an expression here. It's not just returning a number. Notice it's just taking that value and multiplying it by itself three times. OK, so here's the like the bigger program for how to use cheers with Q at the same time. This is kind of a really interesting case. So it's just taking the previous function, which returns void, which has no return value, return type of void, and then double, 
for the cube function. It has both of those. Look, let's look at main right here. Okay, the first thing it's doing is calling cheers, which is just going to output cheers five times. Right? Then it asks for a number and gets the volume of that number and prints that out. So it takes calls cube with whatever you've typed in here. It'll might take this value, multiply it by three, multiply itself three times, put it back into volume, and then print that out. Print the size and then print the volume of here. So it prints out that value. And then look at the very last statement before the return. It says cheers cube two. So the way that this works, and we briefly talked about this before, is you work from the inside out, right? So when you see that function cube, what's going to happen first is going to be like, oh, cheers, I want to call cheers, but let me figure out what number to pass in to that function cheers. The number you're telling me to pass in is another function call. What does cube do? It goes and multiplies 2 times 2 times 2, right? To return back 8, right? Cube actually does all of its work before cheers even gets called, okay? So Q will calculate the cube of 2, which is 8. Take that value 8, and that gets put into the result of what cheers wants in the argument list. So cheers here, when you're calling cheers, you're actually passing in the number 8. Okay. And it works from the inside out. So the first order of operation is that it will resolve what the cube of 2 is, take that return value, and then resolve what cheers is. Okay. questions? So this is what the result looks like. It was 8 in case you weren't calling Q. Just a little note on prototypes. A prototype really just looks like the function definition, looks exactly like it with a semicolon on the end of it. There is one thing you can do. You don't have to give a name for your arguments when you're writing the prototype. It's OK to drop them. I would favor using names because oftentimes, you can tell more about what a function does by its argument names than by the function name itself. And oftentimes you're only looking at the prototype. If you leave the names out, it also makes it harder to tell in Visual Studio when you type a function name, it tries to help you by describing what each argument is for and uses that by looking at the prototype and looking at the names in the prototype. So I would just always name your variables. Notice here you can leave them out. So this int, and let me just go back. It's like that. Notice he named double x here. He could have left off the x as well if he wanted to. He could have also put n inside the name of the prototype for that argument too. I would just favor just always put the name in there. Right? Jump ahead to multiple arguments. And jump back. You can have a function with multiple arguments, as I mentioned before. Really, the only difference is that when you have multiple arguments, you're separating each argument with a comma. And when you're calling them, you just separate each argument that you called with a comma as well. It doesn't really look, you, you, you can't leave out the type, neither of the types are the same. Every one of these arguments has to have a type and a name when you're declaring it. But you can leave off the name if you want to in the prototype, just like I said, but I would just favor doing it like this, keeping the name there, especially here, because you know that you require a prep and integer, but you have no idea what those mean. I would even argue that the argument names that he chose here are kind of too small. Typically, you try to be descriptive with your variable names, kind of like what this is. He could have called these two variable names 
So instead of weight and volume, W and V. Yeah. But now you are clear that, okay, that means weight and volume. Or he could have just left these out in the name too. Our standard is that we just try to be as descriptive as possible. We name everything. Okay. So here's an example of calling that function with two arguments. You want to just focus here on the function call. It's passing in the letter, the character ch, which is what you typed in here, using ch here, and times is how many times they want to print it out. So here, ch times. And then the end care is here. This is a while loop that prints that character out that many times. And so the output looks like that. Okay. Questions on that? Multiple arguments, pretty straightforward. Um, I will explain this a little bit more about passing arguments by value um, and also the scoping of the arguments. I will say that this is kind of an important piece. It's worth reiterating. The lifetime of variables, what we call the scope of a variable, So if we look here, we're actually using the variables i and n in two different places. If you declare a variable, that lifetime of that variable is within the scope of the braces that it's within. So n, i, and y get created on these lines and get destroyed when those variables, what are called, go out of scope. That is, when you hit the n brace for where those variables were declared in. It also means that the accessibility, the where those variables lives are within the scope of that function. Which means that inside Cheers, even though I have variables called n and i, they're within the scope of the Cheers function, while n and i here are in the scope of main. So you can have those two variables, and they'll each be unique. Each of those are its own variable. They're not sharing the same variable at all. Okay. So even though n is equal to 20 and i is equal to 1,000 here, when I call cheers, here n is equal to 10 and i is equal to 0. So there's, there's two copies of those variables. Even though they have the same name, they're completely different. Okay. Keep in mind that that's the scope of those variables. So when you declare a variable, they're private to the function. These variables are called local variables. Yeah. So then, if you want to use it for that sense of cheers, the already has the thing n. What if you wanted to like get the main then instead, but without passing it through an argument? You can't do that unless it's global. These variables are inaccessible. These variables, Cheers knows nothing about, unless you pass it to it, or if you pull these out of main to be in the global space. You guys remember we did tic-tac-toe? I asked you guys to put stuff in global variables. So that is the difference. There are two types of variables, local variables, which are variables that live inside the scope of a function, and global variables, which are just outside the scope of every function. Anything that's global, every function can access, no matter where they are. So if I move these three variables above here, I actually have a problem now, because now I have a global variable here that this function also has a variable called n and i. Now you're doing what's called a variable shadowing, which is that two things are trying to use the same variable name. And that typically ends up being a bad thing. It, it, it'll, the rules are kind of vague, but typically the most local variable, that means the most recent variables get precedence. But I would just say, in general, you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be putting things in the global space, which is outside the scope of function, unless you absolutely need to, unless you need that thing to be accessed across all functions. Um, yeah, these variables here, n, i, and y, are what are called local to the main function. While well, these two variables, n and i here, are local to the cheers function. Okay? Those are called local variables. Okay. All right, so here's what I want you guys to do. This is all in chapter 7, by the way. So all these function declarations were in chapter 7. I'm going to put the lab and homework in Zool, and then uh, I'll call it for class today. You guys can stay after and do lab if you want to. Um, on Zool, I put this lab and homework. This is what's due for next week.
past the point of having to talk about functions and loops, like we have to move on. So, but I understand it's been a moment, so. Yeah, I think this, uh, this is what's new. You can write them all in the same file if you want to. You can do separate files. 